This is the Startup Tri-Valley podcast, featuring in-depth conversations with the leaders who are making the Tri-Valley the go-to ecosystem for science-based startups. I'm Yolanda Finchenko from Startup Tri-Valley. Today we're here with CEO and co-founder of Vector Comic, Jamil Abu Shair. Jamil, welcome to the pod. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I'll tell you, to be honest, this is the first podcast I've done, so I'm a little nervous myself. Uh, go easy on me. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> so I think the easiest thing to do is to start with telling us a little bit about your company, um, what you do, and also without, of course, revealing trade secrets or something, what's so special about your company and why you're the best company to do what you do? I wouldn't say we're the best. Uh, maybe I would. Okay. So yeah, no problem. Thanks for, uh, certainly thanks for having me. So uh, Vector Atomic is developing quantum technology for navigation and timing. And that might sound uh, esoteric, this quantum technology, but it already has been impactful uh, in our everyday world. Uh, our financial, our uh, transportation, energy, defense sectors, they all rely fundamentally on uh, GPS and GPS has enabled a trillion dollars in economic impact in the U.S. alone. And GPS is enabled by 1960s atomic clocks. And so we are trying to build that next generation of quantum technology to hopefully unlock that next trillion dollars, hopefully, of uh, of economic impact. And so uh, we come from a world that uh, myself and my co-founders, uh, we uh, built a lot of this kind of quantum hardware as graduate students and postdocs. And in these laboratories, these are the best measurement devices on the planet, bar none. The clocks are good to a second in 50 billion years. The problem is, is that they're uh, large, they're fragile, they're expensive, and they're typically uh, manned by a small army of grad students and postdocs. And so we want to build commercial versions of these that are portable, that can go out into the world. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to focus on things like integration, uh, operability in real-world environments, uh, reliability, and certainly things like cost. So uh, in doing that, we started this company. We're a little over five and a half years old. Uh, it was just the three of us to start. No uh, no money, no lab space, no nothing, just a couple laptops uh, when, we, when we got going. But things have blossomed. We're now 42 uh, employees. We're located in Pleasanton, California, uh, in the Bay Area. You know, why, why are we good? Um, you know, I think we're really focused on uh, getting the technology out into the world. I think we're zealots about that. We're certainly, no one would accuse us of being, uh, you know, titans of business. We really uh, want to develop the technology, build it, and show that we can uh, take it out in the world and it can be impactful. And I think because of that, it's really focused us. We're really technology f uh, first and uh you know, with that in mind, we just grind through everything, COVID, you know, any, anything that's thrown at us, you know, we're all playing by the same rules as, as everyone else. It's a real challenge, but we are uh, intent on getting the technology out in the world and we do whatever it takes to, to make that happen. Great. So it sounds like your inspiration was really taking advantage of the, um, technology that quantum technology offered and your recognition that the only way for it to become influential in our day-to-day -day lives by transforming something like GPS and the atomic clocks was to take something that's normally very esoteric and researchy and productize it. And that's, that's what kind of is is yeah. motivating everything everything that you're doing yes yeah, so the universities have lived up to their end of the bargain mm -hmm. and that's the world we came from uh you know they've kind of developed the the core technology the techniques uh but you know what they have i would call it like a quantum rube goldberg machine if you're right. familiar with with yes. uh, what those are very complicated devices but you know demonstrably you know incredible performance right. um and so, but they're kind of building these, you know, these uh, devices up with kind of the Legos of our, right. of our industry. And we want to purpose build things, make them small, make them cheap. Uh, yeah. So it, I would say it's an evolution of mm -hmm. 
where we came from. Mm -hmm. And we just want to keep on going with that. I think, you know, when we were grad students and postdocs, we would never think I worked on a a very esoteric, uh, uh, you know, part of this technology known as Bose-Einstein condensation, Mm -hmm. cooling atoms down to very low temperatures and, and looking at their properties. Uh, and I was very excited to kind of contribute to the world's knowledge base. I'm very excited now that we can take a lot of those tools and techniques and bring them out into the real world and potentially impact, you know, half the world's population on a given day through uh, things like GPS. So our clocks aren't in GPS right now, but, you know, that's our goal in the next five to 10 years is that uh, when we're walking around somewhere uh, on the planet and you see, you know, some other country and you see someone using their GPS to to get somewhere, uh, we can know that our technology is underlying that. That's really exciting mm-hmm. for us. That's how, you know, as atomic physicists, that's kind of maximally impactful. Right. Uh, so that's what drives us, gets so us up in the morning. Vector atomic inside. Yes, that's yes. the hope. <laughs> <laughs> so I have kind of a two-part follow-up question. What was what what was the spark where you and your co-founder said uh now is the moment. We we've we've done this research, you know, presumably worked to some degree at something and and you're like, "Okay, you know what? We're we're done with relying on just doing very fundamental research. It's time to take this and make it part of people's phones, part of satellites. Sure. And then, so what was the spark? And then what do you feel in your, in your background prepared you to, to take that spark and actually create a company? Sure. So, um, you know, the spark, we had been out in the world. So we had these backgrounds and, and, uh, the co-founders and I, we had worked in industry, we had worked in academia, I had worked in the government. So we had a lot of experience with the technology and it was very promising. But I think for us, we really wanted to focus on near-term technology. And that mm-hmm. that's what was uh, exciting for us. And it just, it came to a point where we were all kind of looking for the next thing to do and started interviewing for other jobs, things like that. Mm-hmm. And we thought, why don't we just give this a shot? Let's just, you know... Uh, you know, why not? We're going to take, you know, basically the idea was, you know, we'll get together, we'll do this for six months, we'll see if there's any traction. Uh-huh. And if we can't get any, we'll try to go get jobs at a big tech company or something. Right. And, you know, fast forward five and a half years later, it did take off. Some days I wish it hadn't. And we were working for that <laughs> big tech company when we're dealing with, you know, things like COVID. But it's been, it's been, you know, really amazing. So I, I think we kind of, you really just have to take that that leap. Mm-hmm. And we were just at points in our life where, I mean, it was interesting. We had, you know, everyone had young kids or kids on the way. And we just said, we're just going to dive into this and, mm-hmm. and try it. And I think we knew we had the safety net that there are a lot of jobs in this area. Mm-hmm. So if it doesn't work out, someone will, will hire us. Um, so we went in full bore. And mm-hmm. I think that was really important. We weren't dipping our toes in. We mm-hmm. just... We started one day and we just started grinding away, you know, as hard as we could on this kind of singular focus. And so started out, you know, trying to win small, you know, business grants, things like that. And uh, and we kind of had some success and things blossomed mm-hmm. uh, from there. I'm forgetting your other the, the follow up question. <laughs> what, what do you think prepared you to actually seize the day? You know, I think that. uh the training, you know, the, there's obviously the direct training of being, you know, an atomic physicist and working on atomic physics. And, and uh, my two co-founders do more of that day to day. I do less of that uh, in my current role. But when you go and you get a Ph.D., it, it kind of teaches you how to uh, how to tackle any kind of problem. So, yeah, we were doing quantum physics. But, you know, what was I really doing in graduate school is like plumbing electronics, right. you know, uh, yes. data analysis, all these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Quantum technology is built from classical technologies. Mm-hmm. And so you just kind of learn to deal with things. We worked very hard. So, you know, you learn kind of working at these at these extreme levels. When I was an undergraduate, I thought I could never work as hard as mm-hmm. I'm working now. And I went to graduate school and I was wrong. You could work a lot harder. You could work harder. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that was great. Uh, and it, it uh, you know, it, I think that kind of 
discipline or you know what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. And then also looking at these problems and just saying, yeah, this is a new problem, but I can solve it. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer solving problems in quantum physics. I'm personally solving accounting problems, right. you know, uninteresting problems. Right. They actually are interesting, but, you know, very different. But, you know, these problems come and for a second you're scared and you think, you know, I don't know anything about this, but I think the approach is, you know, how do we look at the problem? How do we take it apart? How do we solve it? And, and you know, that personally for me, that training uh, is, has helped in, in my current role. So your, your academic training and the discipline that it took in order to get your PhD in atomic physics, it sounds like it, what you feel like it did is give you and your co-founders the skills to pretty much tackle any problem with the same rigor. So whether that problem is, you know, I, I need to form a business, what's step one through N, or the problem is we have formed a business and we promised that we would develop it to this point and we've hit this technical challenge. How do I solve it? So you're taking that same training and applying it with equal rigor to the business side and the technical side. Does that? Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. Like I said, the co-founders, they're they're practicing the atomic physics. And I wouldn't say I, I have nothing to do with that work anymore. My job is really to take these complicated ideas now and distill them down and kind of package them uh, in a way that's, you know, uh, that uh, is that the customers can understand um, that can resonate with them so that they are willing to, you know, put their dollars toward essentially kind of investing in our development with the hope that we're going to mm -hmm. in the end deliver products that they can that they can use and, and can solve their challenges. So, uh, Absolutely. The, the, the training is direct. The training is also, uh, you know, has been indirect. So hearing you talk about your co-founders and, and what the division of labor that you've described, you're all three of you basically have the same back, background in, in atomic mm -hmm. physics. How did you decide who was going to be the CEO, who was going to be primarily the CTO? And how did you feel about it? Yeah, it was, you know, different, different um, experience. We had gone into uh, different roles. We had different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the co-founders, his background was directly in atomic clocks. One of the other co-founders, it was in these atomic inertial sensors, mm -hmm. force sensors, rotation mm -hmm. sensors. I had worked uh, in the government and a big part of my role was kind of advocating for the technology. Mm -hmm. Like I said, uh, you know, kind of trying to explain it in simple terms, distill it down, but, but you know, really be able to uh, explain the impact and kind of managing these larger programs. So I think the division was, was fairly natural. Mm -hmm. I think what's great is that those divisions are not hard divisions. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not, uh, everyone is always willing to help. I mean, this is the big, you know, if you've found a company with people you trust and people who are going to show up, uh, it makes things a lot easier and a lot less lonely. I think if I had tried to start a company on my own, I, I never would have actually considered it. I had two people, uh, you know, that I had a lot of trust in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I've learned, and COVID would be the biggest example of this, but there are a lot of minor um, issues that come up. There's just minor crises. Things are going well, but there's always something bad happening and that you that you have to address. And right. And it's, are you doing that on your own or are these other people going to step up? And, you know, I've just, we found ourselves in situations at, you know, midnight where we're asked for some information or we realize there's a proposal we could turn in and they're never like, that's the CEO's job. They, right. they step up and, right. and, you know, they really, the question is like, how can I come in and help? And the three of us tackle the problem and we, we make it through. And so it's. You know, we've the three of us have been there from the start, so we're deeply, mm -hmm. you know, we really understand what's going on under the hood, and we're deeply invested in in making it work. Um, so, as we grow, there's a challenge of kind of shedding some of these responsibilities. Mm -hmm. You know, Marty is no longer doing HR; Matt is still doing IT, but right. we <laughs> We hope to to not have him do that. And it's just like these things are happening. You know, there's the stuff we like to do that happens on hours and the stuff we have to do right. to run the business. And that's like what's happening off hours behind the, the scenes. Right. 
So it's it sounds like a lot of the role definition was you leaning into existing experiences Mm -hmm. and then and it's been very fluid uh, because you are functioning more like a team and now as your company company's gone from three people to 42 you are having to say like put some boundaries and say maybe maybe this is more mainly my job and you know the the atomic clock person is also not going to do the hiring package. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the I think it's it's a it's a trade-off. It's really challenging because again, we know every part of our business and things like hiring we take very serious mm-hmm. uh, seriously. Um and so we really want to kind of get things right. There's this there's this you know, change that happens when it's You know, the company is 10 people and the CEO is filling the drink refrigerator or doing this kind of stuff. And and that's good. We're all in the mix. And and that, you know, people feel like, okay, we're all here willing to contribute in any way we we can. Uh, But then you become a 40 person company and people look at that and they're thinking this isn't what the CEO should be. Right. should be doing. And so that transition is hard. And, and when you've done all that stuff, that transition is hard for me. I like doing right. some of those things. But yeah, your time is better spent. And I think, you know, we've kind of hit these milestones when we went from 10 people, uh, you know, or we got up to 10 people, we realized we needed some administrative help. When you get up to 20, you need more. You um, and, and each time we kind of get to these friction points where we have to change the way we do business, we have to adapt. And it can't be that we're you know, doing all the things that we're doing and people can shed those responsibilities and there's enough work to focus on what's what's important. And so that doesn't mean that that work isn't important anymore. It's just that we can hopefully find people who are actually better than mm-hmm. us at doing the job. And that's what's exciting for me, that we have an organization where we plug in new people um, and they're hopefully better at purchasing than I am. And they 100% are, you know, or better at, <laughs> at you know, yeah, reconciling all the accounting and, mm-hmm. and that's their focus. And um, so that's, that's exciting. As we kind of grow up, we run a very lean organization. Mm-hmm. So of those 42, 38 and a half of them are doing technical work. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what allows us to really punch above our weight. We're mm-hmm. taking money from the government and we want to make sure that, uh, as much of each dollar they give us goes into the technical work. That's mm-hmm. what they're paying us to do. They're also, you know, helping pay our operational costs, and we just want to keep those low. We want to, mm-hmm. you know, really be frugal in the way we do things and um, and put the resources toward what is ultimately the the goal for the company. So, so many follow up questions are popping into my head based on what you said. I'm going to zero in on on the last thing you mentioned because it speaks to your business model. So you you are delivering value to your customer, which at this point is the government, and and this is how you're funded. Yep. So talk a little bit about the decision to take government fund your business model and taking government funding versus say investor dollars. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think that is very much how a startup like ours in particularly in this area differs Mm -hmm. from a lot of the other startups is that we're 100 percent funded on uh, federal government contracts and so we have no outside investment we have no debt um you know we are a revenue positive Mm -hmm. company but we are uh also very much like these other startups in that we're trying to develop technology we want to be we don't see ourselves as a government contractor we see ourselves as a product company but Mm -hmm. it just takes some time to develop those products. So why did we go the government route? Um, we did that because that was the world we came from and mm-hmm. that's what we knew how to do. Mm-hmm. So uh, I would say we were very savvy in that area, but it is harder to build up those mm-hmm. resources than say get getting a single pot of VC money. So we mm-hmm. figured we would try that first, again, see if we got some traction. And if not, you know, maybe we could also look into uh, external or VC funding, mm-hmm. but we've been able to get enough traction to, you know, build up and operate a 40 person company. Mm-hmm. It's more of a grind. I think it's, uh, you know, maybe a slower progression. doesn't seem that way. It's a lot of people over, uh, five years, but it's just the world we came from and mm-hmm. it's kind of where our savviness was. And, and we were able to, 
first, you know, kind of win small contracts and good ideas. Mm -hmm. And, and now I think we're, you know, now we're winning larger contracts based on our performance Mm -hmm. and, you know, taking just basic ideas to subsystems, to systems, to, um, you know, boxes that are operating out on ships in the, in the real world. So what what I think I'm hearing you say it, it kind of similar to the way you decided who, what your roles would be. It, it's again looking at where you already had experience and leaning into something you were already comfortable doing. You had developed skills in doing, probably relationships in in mm-hmm. doing, and starting from there and recognizing the trade off, which is you're going to have to cobble together a series of contracts or rather than get a single pot of money Mm -hmm. from an investor. And uh, really it was piloting it Mm -hmm. where you started and said, I think I'm, we can do this. So let's try this first. If it doesn't work out, we'll try the other thing. But the first thing worked. So, yeah. And I think we can look at it in retrospect and say, there was more thought that went into it, mm-hmm. <laughs> like what you're saying. <laughs> and I think to some extent we were like, let's just try this and see what happens. My, right. you know, one of the co-founders, uh, Matt uh, Cash, and you know, something I really respect in him is he will just go after mm-hmm. something. There's things that are scary or they're hard. And I'd sometimes look and say, man, we can't do that. And he just, you know, or someone isn't doing it, he'll just go and do it. You know, it's not, he... It, just really takes actions. And I think, you know, at the time when we were thinking about starting a company, you know, I remember we were walking out of some meeting and he was like, should we start a company? Like, we're going to go start a company now. And I was like, okay, I guess. <laughs> and I, cause I wanted, I respected that in him and I wanted, and I was like, this has served him well. I should do this. You know, I should be like this too. I mean, my friend in grad school also, you know, he would always say, I don't know where it came from. Like, there's no idea that's too, or, some ideas are too bad not to try. And, you know, that was kind of the the approach we took where it's just like, okay, throw a caution to the wind, you know, um, right. and let's, let's see if we can do this. We're all, uh, you know, I think the, the thing about the three founders and the company in general, we want to win. You know, mm-hmm. we want to do really well and we're competitive. I think we're competitive in a friendly way, but we really, you know, we're excited and we, you know, we want to be uh, – out there doing good stuff. And so that really was the motivation. I don't think we expected it to grow as Mm -hmm. as fast as it was. We thought we would be out in the wilderness for a little bit longer and we would kind of slowly build up the company. But I think it's a testament to the work that those two guys have done, the good ideas Mm -hmm. that they have. I mean, I, you know, I did a good job of packaging their ideas, but they're the ones who actually deliver it. And then the team we've built out Mm-hmm. you know, to, to do it. We really have uh, an extraordinary team. And I know everyone says their people are their most important, <laughs> you know, the staff is, is the most important. I think that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's certainly been true for us. And we painstakingly, you know, try to uh, find the right people, you know, recruit the right people, retain them um, to do the work we're trying to do, because it's very hard and they need to have that kind of same attitude as well of, you know, this is hard and, you know, I may be a little bit scared, but we're just going to go and we're going to tackle it. We're going to solve the problem. I'm curious, based on that experience of, of applying this, this competitiveness and also uh, just commitment to trying, just acting, as you said, acting and um, looking at, and I don't, maybe you could talk about a little bit too, about how long your timeline was as you were looking at developing the company, how long did you think you'd be in R and D versus product? And for the founders out there who are looking at maybe a similar timeline, how, I don't know if you feel like you could, but like what advice would you give in terms of evaluating, like based on this timeline, uh, do I start with government grants? Do I go straight for, you know, I'm going to pitch this just, and, and I know you didn't have the experience of pitching, but I'm curious how you, you looked at the timeline yeah. and, and how that influenced you. I think we had been involved in the technology for many years in, in one way or another. And, and 
you have to be realistic about what the timeline is, especially since we're building hardware. We're not building, mm -hmm. you know, a, a dating app or something, yeah. you know, where it's everyone will get some pizzas and we'll all stay up right. overnight for, you know, two weeks. And there's no and, hackathon and, that's going to solve this. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, knock it out. Yeah. yeah. It's a, you got to be in it for the long term. And that had been um, our experience. So I think what's really important is that you, are realistic about that. So you can, um, there's nothing, uh, you know, there, I certainly wouldn't criticize taking VC money. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Um, the challenge you have there is that you sometimes end up making promises that ultimately, you know, that might be driven by the VCs. They want to see progress on a time scale kind of set, maybe mm -hmm. 18 months or two years that isn't always compatible with the, the reality mm -hmm. of the technology. And that's fine. You, you know, everyone, there's a certain amount of salesmanship you do to sell the project, but then the money comes and, you know, that eight, that money will run out over 18 right. months or two years, and then you have to pay the piper, you mm -hmm. know, and that's a, um, that's a real challenge. So really trying to be realistic with, you know, for us, it's a little bit different. Um, maybe the the uh, program managers at the funding agencies of really saying, this is what we can do. They have ambitions. We all have the same goal mm -hmm. in mind, which is to get this technology out into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so kind of helping, you know, it's important for us to be realistic because if they're promising their boss that this technology is going to be there in two years and then mm -hmm. we don't deliver it, it's not helpful for them. It's not certainly not right. helpful Right. Uh, to us. So, you know, it really has, you got to take a, a very kind of metered approach and you have to really go through and try to solve every piece of it. You mm -hmm. know, we all have kind of the parts we love about the job mm -hmm. um, and people will fall back on focusing on those things. But, you know, if we're going to make a product, our products kind of have three things. They have you know, mechanical systems, they have lasers and optics and electronics. If we're going to make these things small and cheap, we have to do all three. We can't mm -hmm. just say we're going to do the thing we love to do as graduate students. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of really laying things out, making sure that your ideas are realistic. I don't think we had a timeline. We knew, mm -hmm. you know, we had been in the game long enough to know this is going to take some time. And so right. it's important for us, you know, and, and I think we do this on our own to show progress mm -hmm. to our customers that we really are on the right track. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things like operating these uh, devices out in the real world. We took, I mentioned we took, you know, a gravimeter out on a ship. We were scheduled to do that, but then there was the opportunity on that ship. Uh, there was some free space. And so we really pushed to get our clocks on board too. No one mm -hmm. asked us to do that, but mm -hmm. it was important to demonstrate the, the technology. And so, you know, we kind of scrambled and went out of our way to do that. So you really, it, it requires, you got to be stoic. There's one, mm -hmm. you know, what you write in the proposals or what you tell the VCs, but you know, when the, when the money comes, you have to know exactly kind of what you're going to do mm -hmm. um, and do enough that someone's going to want to write another check, whether that's the VC or the government, you know, two years later or three years later when the, when the program ends. So it sounds like really what what you're advising is first be realistic but also really understand what what is the return on investment that whoever you're asking to invest in what you're doing is looking for. So and and can you achieve that in a in the in the time frame that they expect you to. So it really comes back to matching people's understanding expectations understanding how they're rewarded yeah, and, and making sure that you are contributing to their success so that they feel like their money was well spent. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, uh, I think everyone is well-intentioned and everyone has the, the same ultimate goal in mind, mm -hmm. you know, what they might ask for, maybe that's too hard to do. And mm -hmm. it's up to us to say, okay, that's, you know, we see what you're trying to do. We have the same goal in mm -hmm. mind and, you know, let us do this slightly different thing. And mm -hmm. the chances of success are much higher for us right. and you're right. going to get something out of it. And, um, we will all, yeah, benefit from that. So there, there is a kind of a lot of, 
um, you know, shaping of what we're doing. And really, we try to be very honest with where mm -hmm. the technology is because it it can win you something mm -hmm. <laughs> short term. Right. But, but, you know, long term, um, you're going to uh, I'm trying to think how to say it in words appropriate for this podcast you're, you're gonna frustrate people in right. the in the long term and they're not going to want to do business right. with you and right. so it's very important for us to you know convey where things are and try to convey it honestly and if things aren't going well to you know say that or just take a more metered approach to, right. to developing the technology yeah what i what i think as i listen to what you're saying is what you, what you're really underscoring is the importance of treating uh, your funder or your customer as a relationship, first of all, and but also that that it's something you're in conversation with. So you're not, um, I, I think there's a temptation for people to look at funding as some kind of blessing, right? Like they, someone's agreeing that your idea is good. And what you're saying is, it's a relationship. It starts with a conversation. Part of what we bring to the relationship is our own understanding of our technology, what's hard and what's easy. And that might mean having the conversation that says what you're asking for is too hard and we can do this that moves us closer to what you're asking for if you adjust your expectations. Yeah. It's better for everyone. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the thing. We won't sign up to do something yeah. I mean, we signed up for some crazy things, I, you know, because we didn't know any better. We signed right. up to uh, build a, a atomic gyroscope for space in, mm -hmm. in two years. We had no background building anything for space. Typically, these things can take several years, but we just, uh, you know, again, sometimes you're too naive. We just delivered it yesterday to the... Congratulations. To, thank you. Uh, we're, we're super excited about that. I mean, really an amazing job by a very small team um on our end but you know you don't um it doesn't ben benefit anyone to yeah. uh, there can be these short-term gains you know for people not to have a realistic idea of the technology you know they're looking on us to be honest about right. about where things are and we won't sign up for if the numbers are you know the requirements are crazy we mm -hmm. you know it, it can be frustrating but we won't sign ourselves up for that we'll go back and say you know, here's what's challenging about this and here's what we can do mm -hmm. and still ambitious, still risky, but not impossible. And I think that that is respected. You know, mm -hmm. people, no one's trying to ask for the moon. And sometimes, you know, they might not understand that they're asking for the moon mm -hmm. because they've heard somewhere else that the moon is attainable. Right. <laughs> you right. know, and, uh, it's not good for them and it's certainly not good for us to build a doorstop. You know, in the end we spend, you know, get some contract for millions of dollars and not finish it. And there's just a beautiful piece of non-working machinery, you know, propping a door open. Right. It's much more important to take the stuff, you know, out, show what it can do in the, in the world. And that's, you know, yeah, that's the focus. And so you, you've alluded to a couple of things that, uh, I think would qualify as surprises. I'm curious, what are some of the things that surprised you most uh, in starting a company? I mean, the I, I think I already said this. No one could have prepared for COVID. Nobody. If I had a crystal ball <laughs> and I looked into it and saw COVID was happening, I would have never in a million years uh, agreed to, yeah. to to start the business. Um so there are large things like that, and there were big surprises along the way that mm -hmm. kind of challenge, uh, you know, all companies associated mm -hmm. with that. First, how do we work together? We're a company that's building hardware, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of restrictions. And we operate in Alameda County, one mm -hmm. of the most restrictive counties in the in the country. And so, how do we do that? How do we still build hardware? We can't just send everyone home. I mean, in some cases we sent people home with hardware and, you know, a guy has an atomic clock on his kitchen table that he's <laughs> the best place for it, that he's building. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, again, that's just like, okay, everyone has, everyone who's building an atomic clock right now has the same problem we have. What are we right. going to do about it? Right. Um, right. Uh, 
you know, so the first challenge is, yeah, how do we how do we operate um, mm-hmm. with that? The next thing that became a challenge was uh, hiring more people mm-hmm. in in COVID. A lot of you know, there's a lot more opportunity to work from home. People wanted to do that. There was a a time when all the tech companies were just getting as much talent as they could. Yeah. Um, and again, people could work remote. And so us, you know, being able to find people and still grow. So the, the just doing the work and figuring out how to do that was a challenge, figuring out how to continue to hire people. It wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't necessarily have as many people at all times as we would like. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's starting to get better now, which is really encouraging uh, for us. Uh, and then it's then you can't order parts, you know, mm-hmm. um, things like this. You you read these things in the news about uh, all these chip problems. And, you know, I just don't even think about how it affects us. And then we can't, you know, none of that. Right. None. Of, we've designed boards and things like that all, um, you know, with all these various chips in them and they're not available and everything needs to be redesigned. And, um, you know, really just kind of several challenges along the way. So those were all big surprises. And I think, again, it's, you know, kind of how relentless Mm -hmm. these, you know, anywhere from pretty big stuff like that Mm -hmm. to just small things come up that, you know, even in times and generally we're in, you know, things are going very well for us, that there are always these minor crises that that are popping up that we have to address. So, you know, there's never a time when you, you know, sometimes I'm like, man, this is an easy day for me. Nothing on the schedule. I don't really have much to do. And that's pretty atypical and yeah. guaranteed something will come up to right. uh, to fill that time. So just always, you know, all the things that one needs to address yeah. along the way to to operate a business and to operate a business of, of our size and to grow it. So do you, do you feel like having having done this for a few years that what you're seeing is that that what may qualify as a surprise has been normalized where where you're maybe you're still surprised but you know to expect surprises I I wouldn't uh yeah I would say you have a maybe it's just like a low level dread <laughs> <laughs> That these things are going to happen. And so, yeah, I'm less, I'm not necessarily surprised. I'm like, yeah, another uh, unknown unknown. And, and it's, you know, maybe what it is, right. is a, is a surprise, but, um, you know, it gets, you're coping you, you with just, the dread you, though. You just realize that the problems are solvable. They're right. not fun. And you're like, okay, I got to right. figure out this, or I'm going to have to do this, but right. it does really help you with the problem solving and it, and it makes you it's hard mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, you know, grinds on you, but, um, it does also make you feel like you can kind of solve most things. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we operated and built hardware through COVID. We come out of that and we're like, we can do things. Yes. <laughs> like what's the, you know, what can you throw at us? I'll give you a, a, another example. Uh, you know, we kind of were, we try to be very disciplined, you know, run a sustainable business we do make some small profits off these contracts. We squirreled all that money away in the bank. Um, and we were very proud, had all the cash flow to operate the company. The bank we put it in was Silicon Valley Bank. And so, that hurts. you know, yeah. yeah. So one day we're flying high and this isn't an issue and we've solved all our, you know, cash flow issues and we can operate this business long term. And we're proud of the, you know, that we've kind of uh, saved all that money and then it's gone, right. you know. And it's how am I going to all of a sudden, like you're starting from scratch, how am I going to make payroll? The, right. This stuff was all resolved in a, in, in over a couple of days and, right. and it ended up not being impactful. It broke my brain a yes. little bit um, <laughs> and I'll never fully recover from that. But there was 15 minutes where I was in shock. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was just, I didn't know, you, you know, yeah. what to do. But then you kind of take a breath and you think about it. And what are we going to do? How are we going to make our mm-hmm. next payroll? You know, how are we going to operate long term? And, and you know, worked hard over the right. weekend and we had a solution. We were going to be fine. If the mm-hmm. money never came back, which was most of our money, we still had some customers to, mm-hmm. to bill and we were going to be fine. And it was going to be like, money's all gone. We still show up to work on Monday right. and we just keep marching along. Right. The, the, you know, we're playing the long game here. Mm-hmm. That's 
That's such a great and very visceral example. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I, I know. I, we didn't no. have any VCs telling us to pull our money out of the yeah. bank. That's where it doesn't pay to not have VC money. We were the only ones putting money in the bank. <laughs> so, so um, this your your stick to itiveness and your ability to continue i know must rely a lot on your team and you've mm -hmm. talked a lot about that and you're in pleasanton you've built your company here can you talk a little bit about the resources in the tri valley and how that you know you know kind of why tri valley this is the startup tri valley podcast yeah. and really interested in in how this place has has factored into your success. Yeah, there's uh, and and it definitely has in the in the talent pool. There's a very specific and kind of narrow talent that we're looking for um in these atomic physicists and and they're recruited from, you know, all over the country, universities, they're doing postdocs um and, you know, in that small world, you know, they have some awareness and, and they apply. And so they're coming from all over the place. The rest of our staff is coming locally. Mm -hmm. And I think the really great thing is, is that we don't need, you know, 42 PhD atomic physicists. Mm -hmm. um, most of our first hires were, but now most of our hires are engineers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different people with different skills. And I'd mentioned like the, the technologies that go into this, there's nothing really you don't need to know quantum mechanics to be able to, um, you know, build lasers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, design all the all the mechanical parts mm -hmm. and things, things like that. We need very skilled people. And, and those people are actually here. They're just working on other things mm -hmm. for other companies. And not only are they bringing these talents, they have been in the industry longer mm -hmm. than some of us. They might understand, you know, different parts of things they've worked for companies that have fielded real devices that mm -hmm. are going out in and operating in very challenging environments so they're even bringing skills that that we don't have mm -hmm. um, and that's very exciting for us so we have kind of a lot of uh veterans of the of the industry all the way down to you know our administrative people who have worked at other startups <laughs> seen the good and the bad and they can right. give me advice and be like jamil don't do this right. you know um right. I'm like, this seems like a good idea. Really? <laughs> They're like, it did two startups ago. Yeah, too. exactly. I have, yeah. <laughs> so did the CEO at my last company. Um, and that, you know, that advice is, is very helpful. So mm -hmm. yeah, all that talent um, is here and that's, uh, you know, veterans of the industry. That's very exciting. And that can allow us to really kind of uh, pour gasoline on the fire and grow faster mm -hmm. than we would have um, expected. And in terms of, um, so you, you have your business in Pleasanton, uh, you also live in Pleasanton, I do. right? And how, how has the, again, the place, it, it sounds like in terms of recruiting, it's been great. So people who are already living here and you've also been able to attract, uh, people to come here. And I'm just interested in how the place has been from more of a like whole person standpoint. Mm -hmm. Pleasant. Yeah. And um, why did we choose Pleasanton? None of us lived here. Mm -hmm. I lived in Oakland. Um, Marty lived in Sunnyvale. Uh, Matt lived in Gilroy at mm -hmm. the time. And we kind of looked around on the maps. There's a there's a couple reasons, but we were really trying to optimize. We were all at points in our lives we had lived in kind of. All of us had lived in the Silicon Valley area, and it's kind of hard to start your life. It's very expensive mm -hmm. to live there, um, to buy homes and things like that. And it kind of stunts your growth on the whole person level as yeah. you're, you know, the work is good and interesting, but, you know, you're living in a small apartment, the, these types of things. And so, you know, that's that was one of the things that made Matt move out to Gilroy. He wanted mm -hmm. a house. Mm -hmm. He wanted to, right. you know, build stuff and have a garden and all this kind of stuff. So he he, you know, kind of just bit the bullet um, and did that. Uh, so, you know, when we looked, we really tried to optimize for where is housing mm -hmm. affordable right. ish quotes. Y yeah. <laughs> and, California uh, affordable. And, and you know, where, where are there good schools? We right. all had kind of young kids and it was, where can we find a positive place to, mm -hmm. to, you know, raise our, our families. We also had um, a link to, uh, Lawrence Livermore, mm -hmm. when we first started, they gave us some, some, 
space. They have kind of an incubator, mm -hmm. some incubation space there, which was really helpful. This is the AML? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were great. And that kind of also drew us into this, mm -hmm. this area. So we looked here, we looked kind of at Walnut Creek, other mm -hmm. areas, um, and we settled uh, on this area. And I think we were right. The mm -hmm. first couple people were able to buy houses. I think, you know, COVID and all these right. challenges made it really hard. A lot so for, changed. So for me, we were starting a business and, you know, and we had, we were financially tied to the business and there was still some risk. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my wife and I stayed out in, in Oakland with the idea that we were going to buy a house um, basically right, you know, right around the time that COVID came and that kind of uh, through a big right. <laughs> wrench in the situation. Right. And that was Changed a real the timeline. Yeah, it's a real challenge, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and it was a real challenge actually to buy a house out here. I'm the CEO mm -hmm. of the company yeah. and I'm having challenges with that. So um, we really like the place. Housing is a challenge. I think COVID, it pushed people, you know, they could work further from Silicon Valley and it almost kind of like extended Silicon Valley mm -hmm. out into this area. So that's yeah. been frustrating it's a great place you know i love the the schools that you know my the school that my kids go to all this is very positive i like riding my bike to work a couple mm -hmm. times a week um but i'm hoping that something shakes out so that you know all our employees can <laughs> live the same you know right. that same dream uh, right. it's good it's good for them it's good for us because they right. also um you know they become more sticky they're they're here working for the company they're yes. less transient at some point people might look and say you know yeah i love working here and we've heard that sometimes but it's it is expensive in the area mm -hmm. and i want to buy a house right so um it's a challenge yeah no, in the, this area that's a really interesting point the stickiness and the the fact that so you know you you've located your company in a in a great place to live if you can afford to live yeah. And with access to things like the Advanced Manufacturing Lab in, in Lawrence Livermore, uh, National Labs that can, you know, help, you know, give a new company space or access to tools and all these kinds of things. And at the same time, you are still really close to remembering what what made you feel like your your personal life could be stunted, which is if even if I have a great job, even if I'm mm -hmm. doing exciting work, um, working with great people, my my personal life has to be able to move on. Yeah. And and if the region doesn't support that with things like housing and, and I mean, we, the other resources diminish a little bit and you, you lose the stickiness that you have. Yeah. I You know, we pay salaries that in 99% of the country, you could buy mm -hmm. a very nice house mm -hmm. and we happen to be maybe in the one percent of the country where you can't. So it's it's great, and right. you know, but we want to be, you know, we want to be providing jobs where people are, you mm -hmm. know, can buy can buy a home, N not because just to, because of the stickiness, because it's great. It would right. make us proud that we're right. running a company and people are, you know, uh, using their salaries to pay mortgages and buy homes and things like that. And they're going to be long-term employees, positive situation mm -hmm. for, for everyone. So, um, I think we're hoping that, you know, things will, uh, uh you know, adjust in, in a right. way that, that, you know, more people can, can realize that. Absolutely. And I know it's a challenge everywhere in the, yes. in the country. So I'm not, I'm not picking on this area. The area is, is great. I mean, to not bring it up would be to be excruciatingly blind. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's just, it's obvious. And, and it's, and it's worth talking about because it can create problems. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it kind of leads me to my, my next couple of questions, which is, you know, looking at the next five years, um, clearly you got, you are vector atomic is really laser focused on getting to a product to market. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the opportunities and what do you see, what do you see as the challenges um, in doing that and in doing that here in, in the Tri-Valley? I think, again, it's it's adding the the nest, the, the talent and mm -hmm. the right kind of talent. And I think it's here. Mm -hmm. you, you know, there are um, very there are adjacent industries. We're seeing that, um, you know, we are seeing the benefit of some industries that are having challenges. And now we get 
a lot of people from the from you know those industries now applying mm -hmm. to work for us. People who we wouldn't have thought we could get, and we're really excited about that. So, um, so that part is great. I think we see in the next five years that we are really going to be focused on building products. You know what? One thing I haven't mentioned is, um, you know, when we talk about these things, these are kind of uh, devices that will initially go into infrastructure. They're mm -hmm. high value, high cost devices. Mm -hmm. We're not making, you know, $50 things that go mm -hmm. into uh, automobiles. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we would love to do that, but that's a 10 to 15 year goal. Mm -hmm. um, so we're building, you know, our goal is to ultimately build these things first in kind of the tens, then the hundreds, then the you know, hopefully up to the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. And for those first 10 or 100 devices, those will be built, you know, our intent is to build those in Pleasanton, California. We want to really figure out the recipe here. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're going to scale up manufacturing, it's probably going to be in another part of the country mm -hmm. or there may be contract manufacturing. Mm -hmm. But we see this is where the talent is and this is really the hub where we will develop the product. So we intend to be here. We're looking at new space right now to expand. We're in kind of tight confines um, and and we're looking to kind of triple that space and add, uh, you know, the infrastructure for small scale manufacturing, that's things great. like that. So that's what we're going to be doing over the, the next couple of years is we're going to be building, you know, kind of the first prototypes or, you know, first commercial devices. We already started doing that mm -hmm. um, and getting those out into the world. So uh, our intent is to be here. People have kids in school and things like that. So that also, there are practical uh, issues as well. You know, we're, we're here to right. stay. That's fantastic. So looking at expansion um, is very exciting. And, and I know manufacturing here is something that is wonderful. And I, I think every region has, again, referencing COVID, learned the lesson of, of if you can't support manufacturing, um, so it, in your city or certainly at least in the country, there can be real, real problems. Yeah. Um, so anything I didn't ask that you thought I should, wanted to talk about? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, maybe I would just say uh, at a high level, we've built these things and they can make real contributions where are the sensors we're building are operating at the, the state of the art for their form factor. Um, the, the technology is hard, uh, but if you're disciplined, you know, you can, you can make it real. And so it's not a uh, technology that's far out in the future. We have things right now and we have to figure out how to duplicate them and make them cheaper. But, uh, you know, now the kind of the form factor is there, the, the performance is there and, uh, we're getting people who are like, great, can I buy one of these? And, and now we have to build up the capacity to, you know, build the 10 of the devices. They're very complicated systems. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but it's not, it's not a question of whether it can be done at mm -hmm. this point. It, 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 it can, and in some cases has been already mm -hmm. done. It's just now we got to build more of them. So before we close out, any words of wisdom uh, to start up Tri Valley community founders, funders? Um, I would, yeah, I would say, you know, I've seen that you, if you're going to do it, just do it. Just jump out in the ocean <laughs> and you'll swim or you won't. <laughs> and probably someone will throw you a life raft. But if you dip your toe in the water, you're just going to be. You know, it's like when you're first jumping into a pool, you're always right. cold. If you slowly walk in, you right. just jump, jump into the, the deep end um, and go for it. And you'll quickly find out whether there's traction or not. But, you know, people want to play it safe and, you know, maybe do things on the side while they have their job. I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's going to be hard to get going. You know, the good thing for us when we started is day one, we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> you know, we were free, nothing, you know. Uh, and so all our focus was on, was on that. The other thing that I would say is, um, y you know, I think it's very important to find people to work with that you really trust, you know, that, and, and you're kind of, uh, you have a shared vision or just a shared mindset. I don't know that our vision was even totally shared, but 
everyone was willing to work hard. Everyone was really honest. And um, I've seen other situations where, you know, people will kind of get together without knowing each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you pick the right people. And uh, at least if things are going bad, you know, yeah. you're in the foxhole right. with them. They're not jumping out right. of it. So uh, <laughs> I definitely, definitely recommend that. Just go for it. So it sounds... I'm I'm going to encapsulate it in jump in the deep end, bring a friend. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they know how to swim if you don't. <laughs> right. I love it. Well, I think we'll close there. Thank you so much, Jamil, for being on the pod. This has been amazing and love the Vector Atomic t-shirt. Great. Thank you. Right. We're twins today. <laughs> Appreciate you wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> it is my favorite t-shirt. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, you uh, inviting me here. Mm -hmm.